Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Nanometer Accuracy Distance Measurements Between Fluorophores at the Single Molecule Level, presented by Dr. Nico Storman and Dr. Marcin Barsuski. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and is sponsored by Andor. For more information on our sponsor, please visit andor.com. Now, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just use that Ask a Question box and let us know you're having a problem. I'd now like to introduce our presenters, Dr. Nico Storman, Research Specialist, University of California, San Francisco, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Also speaking, Dr. Marcin Barsuski, Imaging Application Specialist, and or. For complete biographies on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab. Dr. Storman and Dr. Barsuski, you may begin your presentations. Well, thank you very much, Christy, for that introduction. I want to present this work that started almost 10 years ago in our lab, and it was um, kind of triggered by my PI, Ron, Ron Phil. Uh, our lab always has been doing a lot of single molecule imaging, and this is more the biophysical single molecule imaging where we label proteins and then look at proteins on uh, cover slips under the microscope. And he was wondering why we couldn't push the resolution of dual color labeled distance measurements down into the nanometer region. It always seemed like a big stretch to me, but nevertheless um, put some work towards that over the years, but never got anywhere near that we really wanted to be until this brilliant graduate student, Stefan, Stefan Niekamp, joined our lab and really put a lot of effort into making this happen and figuring out where the stumbling blocks actually were. And so to um, give you a little bit of an, uh, a background of why we wanted to do this, um, as you may realize, there are other te techniques such as fluorescence or first resonance energy transfer that can measure distances between fluorophores at the uh, nanometer resolution. So with FREP, um, tends to work best around a distance of like five nanometers, let's say roughly two to eight nanometers. Um, when you go to direct uh, localization of single molecules and multiple single molecules, um, it is definitely possible uh, and it was possible for a long time to measure distances down to like 30 or with a lot of effort, maybe 20 nanometers, but getting lower has always proved to be very difficult and um, um, yeah, hard to achieve. And so with our method that I'll be presenting here, we kind of are filling the gap. And why is this gap so interesting? Well, a lot of the macromolecules that we want to understand, whose function we want to understand, and that we would like to study under the microscope, are actually uh, in this site regimen. So having a technique available with in which you can see changes in distance up in the scale of between like five and 25 nanometers is highly, highly useful. Again, to um, the types of experiments that we are doing, uh, our lab is actually, uh, has been interested in molecular motor proteins and especially the motor protein kinesin and dynein. And so we, uh, we have a lot of technology available to attach fluorescent labels on these molecules. We'd like to put two differently colored labels on them and then see and measure their distance, uh, for instance, depending on the nucleotide state or possibly even while these uh, molecular motor proteins are moving on the uh, microtubule lattice. So what do these experiments look like? I'm showing you here uh, a more or less raw image, 
And this raw image for clarity is actually of the, the beads that we use for registration. So we get single molecules uh, uh, in two different colors. Um, they're, they're offset here to each other, and that is because we don't uh, align the two images perfectly in the microscope itself. And so when we now blow one of these um, two spots up, you see that they are, uh, well, we have a red and a blue spot here. They're clearly displaced. And then that is what we feed into our uh, analysis software that uh, uses the Gaussian fit, um, maximum likelihood estimate uh, with a Gaussian model to determine the center location of that spot. And that center location has a certain uncertainty associated with it that I kind of try to represent here in this ball around the center. Then um, we register the coordinate systems of these two colored spots, and then you end up with the, the two colors uh, close together with a certain distance apart from each other. And what we now really want to know is how far is this blue spot from that uh, red spot. So that brings us to the problem of how to measure distances. And then when we uh, go back to uh, elementary school, if you have two points in space and you want to measure the distance, you use something uh, like a, a yardstick or a, a measuring stick, and you you try to find uh, the center of the one spot and the center of the other spot, and you get a distance, and that is usually uh, already a pretty good distance estimate. And if you uh, I really want to know it precise. You do it a couple of times. Um, you get a couple of distance estimates, and then you calculate the average of them. So complicated formula that basically gets that just gets you the average of these measurements. Now that's all uh, very clear and fine, but we have a situation in which our two spots are relatively close together, and there's a rather big uncertainty in where exactly their centers are located. And that uncertainty is kind of at the order of the distance of the two. So when we now try to measure the distance between them, we, uh, we get a certain probability that we think the center is here and here, and then a certain probability that it's there and there. And so when we now measure these things, can we just take the average just like we did here, or are there better ways of estimating the distance? Now, so luckily for us, um, others already thought about this, and when we repeat those thought experiments, when we now replace one of these spots where we don't exactly know where the center is and say, okay, we, let's pretend we know exactly where this red spot where its center was, then the distance to the center of this blue spot can be given by a circle. So all these points on this uh, part of the circle are at the exact same distance. However, when we now try to figure out where the center, where this one is actually located, our estimates will be distributed according to the intensities here of uh, the blue that you see around it. And so you can start to see that on average, most of these more estimates of this will be outside of the circle than inside of the circle. And so that means that our estimate for the distance, if we would just do a simple average, it would be too large. And now this problem uh, gets, of course, compounded if we throw in the uncertainty of this other spot. Uh, so clearly, we are not getting a uh, precise distance uh, estimate by uh, just doing a simple averaging. And um, Stefan did a lot of Monte Carlo simulations, and for these Monte Carlo simulations, we, uh, on the x-axis here, we put the real distance. So, for instance, think here a, a real distance of one, let's say this is 10 nanometers. If we um, 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 uh, have an uncertainty, sorry, so we have here the, uh, on the x-axis, we have the uncertainty with which we can localize uh, the distance, the sigma d, the standard deviation in the distance. 
So when the standard deviation is very small, then our error in the distance measurement is also very small. And clearly, when the uncertainty in the uh, uh, distance goes up, then also our, uh, the error in our estimates using an average goes up significantly. And so you can see here that the uncertainty in the distance is almost linear with the error when we're using a simple averaging. So can we do better than uh, simple averaging? Well, it turns out that others uh, already thought about this problem, and Sterling Churchman in Jim Spudich's lab at Stanford, as a graduate student, came up with this probability density distribution function that, uh, uh, and that, that probability density distribution function um, has the uh, measured distance in it, uh, the, um, the distance uncertainty, as well as the actual distance. And so when we now do a lot of measurement of the measured distance and then uh, fit to this function the distance uncertainty as well as the uh, actual distance, you can actually get out, a, uh, under certain circumstances, a better estimate for what the real distance is. And so here is the error in our, uh, this is again the plot of the uh, averaging, the simple averaging method, and the error that we get as a function of uh, the distance uncertainty. When we now use this P2D method, that we call here the Churchman P2D, you see that for uh, a distance uncertainty below one, this method performs a lot better and our, uh, the error in our distance measure, uh, uh, estimate becomes a lot lower. However, when we go to higher distance uncertainty, uh, we still have a significant error. And now to uh, put this a little bit in, uh, made possibly more easier to understand bar graph. If we have a uh, real distance of 10 nanometers, an uncertainty of 3.7 to 7.5 nanometers, we get a very uh, good estimate of that real distance of 10 nanometers. But when that uh, distance uncertainty goes up and when it becomes higher than the actual distance, our uh, uh, distance estimate completely stale. So um, what this tells us is that this P2D uh, method helps, but it certainly uh, doesn't do miracles, especially if the uncertainty in the distance is larger than the actual distance. So are there ways of getting around that? Um, uh, and so first of all, to, uh, to kind of explain explain why this is happening, it's useful to look at plots of the probability uh, distribution function. So when we uh, plot that function for a, uh, a real distance of 10.5 nanometers and a sigma in the distance of 11 nanometers, you see that that function looks extremely similar to uh, the, function, the same function for a real distance of 0.3 nanometers and a stick-minded distance measurement of 13 and a half nanometers. So what happens when you're um, fitting these functions with a higher um, uh, uh, sigma d is that the, uh, the fit kind of converges to a distance of zero, which is wrong, but that is the best estimate given these parameters. And so that is the reason why at a higher sigma, we get this error of, 10, uh, of about 10 nanometers, and that is because the estimate is actually zero nanometers where it should have been 10. Now, so looking at this formula, um, it already kind of shows we want to know that real distance mu, we are measuring this distance R. So is there something that we can do with this uncertainty in the distance, that sigma d? And so when you think about that, that sigma d actually uh, is given by the uh, error that we do in our image re registration, and that is something that we can measure, and I will talk about that later. It is a function of the 
error in the localization of the first spot and the second spot, and then actually the squares, um, the, the sigma squares of those localization errors also propagate in this area, and that's just uh, because of error propagation rules. But these two, these last things are also all things that follow from our MLE Gaussian fit. So these are basically things we know. So the, uh, the leap that we made was to now, instead of fitting in a P2D function, the sigma d is to actually measure it with other ways and then fixing it in the fit and so that we are only fitting one variable rather than two and that way get a better estimate out. So when we uh, go back to the uh, Churchman P2D, so, uh, and again, these are these graphs are actually all Monte Carlo simulations. This is the same graph that I showed you before. When we now fix the sigma d, since we know it, and then do the same fit, our error all of a sudden drops. And what this says is that even when the uncertainty in that uh, distance is twice as large as the uh, distance itself, given enough measurements, we can still measure it very, very uh, precise. And so this is quite a dramatic uh, drop here at higher sigmas. And this method we call uh, Sigma P2D, and it's kind of the biggest, the, for us, this was the biggest mental breakthrough in understanding how to analyze this data. So now uh, doing the experiments. So we, uh, we use these cover slips on like a little double sticky flow cell with three lanes. We flow in fiducial markers, which are uh, tetraspec beads, beads of fluorescent in multiple channels in the top and bottom lane, and then have our actual sample that we want to measure in the middle lane. The microscope looks something like this. We, it is based on a uh, Nikon TI uh, base. It has an ultra-stable uh, stainless steel stage. It then has the camera, an uh, EMCCD camera directly attached to the left port and the second one to the right port. And so there's an image splitting dichroic uh, uh, in the base itself. And then there's a turf uh, illumination path that, that's home built. So we uh, illuminate uh, with turf and we take a, a one color image on one camera and the other color on the other camera. And we can switch relatively fast between the two. Now when we uh, take these images of the fiducial beads, they very much look like this. But we want these spots, and so here you can easily tell which blue spot belongs to which red spot. But we want a lot of those. Um, in the end, we want to end up with like 10,000 of these fiducial pairs distributed over the whole image. So we simply translate these bead images by um, a micron or something, and we take something like 400 of these so that we get like every point in the image well covered with these fiducials. And then when we um, calculate an affine transform out of all those fiducials and then correct the positions of these spots with that, we end up with a, a pattern like this. And here red indicate, and this is just the offset in X, and red indicates a high offset, and blue indicates a negative offset. And so what is very clear is that there with a uh, global affine transform, there are uh, local variations that will lead to a huge error in our samples if we would apply this. So the strategy that we use is that for every point that we want to know its location, we now select control points in the immediate vicinity. So we have some rules that we want at least 10 of these control points and we don't want it farther than a few microns away. And using that, we can get the, uh, uh, the registration map to look something like this, where you see that the errors are uh, very uh, 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 evenly distributed. Then when we now um, uh, average um, all those errors, we end up with the, the total average error. And you see that in this particular experiment, that error was zero nanometers. Uh, so the registration of this second set of beads worked very, very well. Um, 
However, one thing that we did note is that the standard deviation here, the precision, was quite a bit uh, lower than, or the number was higher, so it was on the order of five nanometers, whereas we had enough photons that it should really be much lower. And we wondered what was going on with that. Ah, I'll get back to that in a little bit. First of all, when we now look at multiple experiments and then plot the uh, error in X as well as in Y, you see that for most of these experiments, we had a an, uh, an total error of less than one nanometer, and we decided to set that as the cutoff. So when the error was more than one nanometer, like in these cases, we would simply not use that data and uh, repeat it. Uh, so uh, on average, our registration error was always less than one nanometer. Now, as I started to tell here, this spread was higher than what we thought it should be, and we were wondering whether that was a problem in our registration, in the alignment, the registration procedure, or that there was something else going on. And therefore, Stefan stepped the beads to different positions and calculated for each individual bead. So all this data here in this uh, rectangle came from one and the same bead. And you see that, so even though we're now using different fiducials to register this bead, um, its distance uh, is very reproducible. So strangely enough, these tetraspect beads have color centers that can be displaced. And the only reason that um, our alignment procedure actually works with it is that we have so many of them that we average out this displacement of the color centers. So one possible improvement would be to find bright objects that fluoresce in both channels and that overlap exactly. Um, so the first um, biological validation that we did uh, used this, uh, uh, our favorite motor protein, uh, kinesin. So kinesin can be rider bound to uh, microtubules. The distance between um, uh, the, the the, the two heads of a kinesin dimer in this rider bound state is known very well. And we can uh, label the kinesin dimer with two different colors um, fluorescently. And so that is what Stefan used to, uh, to see if the method worked well. And so you see here the distribution of uh, 1,261 of these kinesin dimers. Um, and that is fitted here in orange with this sigma P2D. And in this experiment, we uh, measured uh, a distance of 8.5 nanometers with a sigma D of 7.9 nanometers. And you see how favorably that compares to, for instance, the Churchman P2D procedure or a uh, simple Gaussian fit of this um, distribution. And when Stefan repeated the experiment a couple of times, he, got, uh, he measured a um, uh, distance of 8.5 nanometers with a standard error of the mean of 0.3 nanometers. So basically three angstroms. Um, and that still uh, amazes me that we are able with a fluorescence microscope at the third floor, sensor futures nearby to uh, do measurements that go down uh, into the uh, angstrom uh, uh, precision. Now, we were very happy with that, of course. However, what we then started realizing is that when we measured other samples, that the sigma p to d fit never worked very well. And it turned out there was something that we kind of had forgotten about, and that is that uh, in this kinesin uh, example, the distance is very reproducible from kinesin to kinesin. However, most biological samples, that is not the case, and molecule A will have a different distance than molecule B. And then pooling the data like this just doesn't work very well. So the only way to get on with that is to do multiple measurements of each individual molecule. Um, and so when you do that, there you immediately have a choice. So when you now do multiple measurements, we can average all these distances together and say that is our measurement for that single molecule. 
or what one can do is first average the positions of all of the of the uh, uh, the, the start of this distance measurement at one spot, then average all the positions at the other spot, and then measure this one distance between these averaged uh, spot positions. And the second method is what we call vector, um, and it turns out that works a lot better than uh, the first method. And so even using uh, those vector measurements, and again, these are now uh, Monte Carlo simulations, just vector averaging uh, 100 uh, molecules, um, ev vector averaging them over 10 frames, shows you that even with a sigma d of uh, uh, twofold the actual distance, the our, uh, distance estimate is still pretty good, like it's still within like 20% of the real distance. However, when we now combine our P2D measurements with that vector approach, you see that we, uh, we do make uh, a significant improvement. So this vector P2D is what we use for uh, measuring all single molecules that differ in size. So to go back to our formula for uh, the uncertainty in the distance, basically we need to add a term here that captures the variation in the sample itself, the standard deviation of the sample. And by uh, analyzing the same set of data with this vector P2D and sigma P2D, we can see whether the sample is homogeneous or heterogeneous. And I can tell you that most biological samples will be heterogeneous. So we uh, validated the vector P2D approach using DNA origamis. These DNA origamis um, have been designed with uh, two colors at a distance of about 10 nanometers. So these were made by the company Gataquant, and they had actually three color centers for each color close by. They're sitting on oligos that have a certain uh, breathing distance. And so when we now, each of these, when we measure them multiple times, we can find single individual molecules for which we measure a distance of, in this case, 25, 5.7 and 16.3 nanometers. So this goes to show the difference that we can see between individual molecules, but we can measure each of these with a high precision. So when we now pool the data, and in this case, uh, that is for like almost 1,500 of these uh, origamis, um, um, we see that um, uh, the vector P2D approach gives us exactly the expected average distance, whereas the vector approach actually fails us. And then we did this for uh, DNA origamis of 10, 20, and 40 nanometers in length. And these are all three independent experiments, and you see how linear um, uh, the distances are that we uh, measure here. So this gave us enough confidence to trust our vector P2D approach. So we then, um, so Stefan's project, his PhD project actually concerns the larger molecular mode, mode approach in dining. Dining uh, often functions as a dimer. It consists of a large triple, uh, AAA ATPase domain separated by a, a relatively long coiled coil to the microtubule binding domain. And still one of the, the, the main questions in the field is how ATP hydrolysis in this uh, AAA domain propagates itself into changes in microtubule affinity through this coiled coil very, very far away. So Stefan had um, used one of these uh, dining, uh, in this case a monomer, uh, and look at it under the electron microscope. So these are negative uh, EM um, uh, stains, where he used ATP vanadate that kind of mim mimics the uh, ATP bound state, where he sees the, mic the coiled coiled stalk and the microtubule binding domain sticking out clearly out of the ATPase domain. And then the APO, so the no um, um, adenosine phosphate, 
um, bound state, um, he basically could not locate that coiled coil and microtubule binding domain very well. However, that is not a definite argument for uh, a change. It just means that we cannot see it there anymore. So he ended up labeling that uh, dining molecule in the AAA ATPase domain with a site 3 oligo, and at the uh, 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 microtubule binding domain with a uh, ATO647, and then using some clever short uh, DNA oligos, he bound both of these to a uh, layer of uh, uh, streptavidin that was sitting on the cover slip glass. So these molecules land on there, uh, and they're incubated either with um, uh, 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 the, the ATP vanadate or uh, they're in the APO state. So we know to, we knew to expect for the ATP vanadate that we should get a distance between these two colors of about 20 nanometers. And the question was what was happening in the ADP vanadate state. And so uh, after analyzing many of these molecules, Stefan found that for the uh, ATP vanadate states, he found a distance of 18.5 nanometers, whereas in the APO states, the distance was 11.2 nanometers, showing that there's a very clear kind of uh, 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 change in conformation and possibly a local unmelting of that coiled coil, bringing these, the microtubule binding domain much closer to the actual motor domain. Um, so uh, at the moment, he is interested in seeing how dining is stepping, and so he is now trying to work these measurements into uh, dynamic measurements where we uh, can see changes in distance as the, the two microtubule binding domains move on the microtubules. So very quickly, the, uh, all the code that we use is available in this micromanager localization microscopy plugin can be downloaded from the uh, micromanager website. All the source code is also available online. And uh, the, the methods have been uh, published in this PNES paper where this DOI can uh, get you going. So I hope this will really inspire people to uh, start doing simil similar single molecule distance measurements. It really is doable, although it is uh, Affinity to get everything set up right and get it going. And with that, I want to uh, thank our whole lab. Uh, our lab is a really great, inspiring environment. Um, we have a lot of very gifted and talented uh, postdocs and graduate students, and it's a great pleasure to work with them all. We're at UCSF and uh, sponsored by our, and uh, Ron Vail, my PI, is an Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. And with that, I will hand this over to Marcin. Hello and welcome to this uh, second part of webinar. Um, thanks very much to Labroots and to Nico for introduction. And um, in this part of our webinar, I wanted to uh, build a little bit on what Nico has earlier mentioned um, in context of imaging done um, in this research that he has presented. And that's why I chose the topic of EMCC technology used for low light imaging. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about um, what EMCCDs are and what are the applications um, technological underpinnings of it, as well as uh, future for these kind of imagers. So we have heard about sensitivity and I think we all probably can agree that sensitivity is a very important feature um, to have in your imaging system, regardless of what camera type and uh, microscope type and microscope modality you are using. But um, why do we need sensitivity? And what is sensitivity when we talk about this in context of cameras or point detectors? Well, before we actually talk about sensitivity um, in the technological context and the meaning of this word, the question, why do we need it, is 
is quite complex and I think there are multi-angled answers that one can come up with um, to this question. I mean some of these, some of the reasons why we need sensitivity are listed here and they may combine uh, multiple um, bullet points I have listed. So you know you may have a light starved sample like um, in case of uh, the previous um, study we have seen earlier today. Um, you may have single molecules which only may emit a low number of photons and of course then if you have a low number of photons to begin with then taking into account all the losses along the light path you will end up with extremely low number of these photons reaching your detector be it a camera or a point detector. Your sample may be very dynamic which means that you will need to have many frames per second to uh, faithfully image that and because you have um, so many frames per second that means that each frame lasts for a relatively short period of time uh, reducing therefore the amount of integration that you are uh, having per one frame. Um, then there may be a low label density. So, for example, you know you may you may only end up with one or or a few uh, fluorophore molecules attached to your uh, molecule of interest to minimize impact um, on that molecule um, to maybe avoid reducing its mobility, its uh, uh, movement across membranes or or, or number of other um, steric hindrance related issues. Um, if it's a live sample, live cell type uh, setup, you probably want to lower the excitation power um, just to avoid phototoxicity and photo damage um, to your cell, to your molecules inside that cell. And then last but not least, depending on quantum yields of your fluorophores, um, you may need to um, deal with a low number of photons emitted uh, abor upon absorption of excitation photon, which may have bearing on the excitation power that you are using. So as you can see, there are different interconnections between various reasons, you know, and there will be some kind of um, resultant uh, compromise that you will have to take into account when discussing sensitivity and when deciding for a sensitive sensor uh, for your experiment. And this, of course, will have uh, additional trade-offs on top of it. Some of these trade-offs will be directly related to what I just said about you know, fluorophore properties, dynamic sample, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this can be simplified you know, to this to this magic triangle, so to speak, a triangle of sensitivity, speed, and resolution. And um, for many, many years, um, these three properties uh, were um, competing with each other when you were looking at them from a point of a detector. You could have any two of these. You could have sensitivity and speed or speed and resolution and sensitivity and resolution, but not all of not all three of them, because um, if you try to do that, for example, if you have speed and sensitivity, then that means that you will not have good resolution because pixels will be probably large. Uh, because you have large pixels, you will have fewer uh, pixels to deal with. Because you have fewer pixels, you know, your your image, your frame is uh, smaller to digitize by the camera, so you can go fast, but you will not have resolution. Conversely, if you want to have resolution and sensitivity, well then resolution will call for small pixels. Uh, because you have smaller pixels, you'll have more of them. Um, um, and then because um, there are more pixels, the camera takes longer to digitize them, so that will of course impact the, the speed. Sensitivity will also drop because the smaller the pixels become, the less uh, light they can absorb per pixel uh, area. Um, so uh, there are multiple trade-offs to be aware of. Some of these trade-offs have been addressed um, with the advent of CMOS cameras, or so scientific CMOS cameras. However, EMCCDs, as we will see later, still uh, remain the high-end solution for light-starved uh, imaging. So from the point of camera sensitivity, uh, we primarily talk about two key parameters. One of them is so-called quantum efficiency, basically a a proportion, a factor, uh, a percentage uh, factor that will tell you how many uh, photons uh, reaching the camera will be converted into photoelectrons, uh, and of course the higher the better. Um, the top end cameras, um, EMCCDs or CMOS will be will have this factor in the range of 95-97% for um, green yellow part of the EM spectrum. The other factor is uh, the noise floor, 
and that's basically some of different noises that a camera or a point detector will have. Um, there are many different components to this. Um, suffice to say that you want the noise floor to be as low as possible and the quantum efficiency as high as possible. Uh, and in this situation, you can ensure that um, your low light signal will be detected by the camera um, down to a single photon level in some cases. And that's why uh, EMCCD's cameras have been introduced um, quite a while ago, almost 20 years ago, and they were introduced as a high performance alternative to slow scan CCDs. CCDs were great because they had very low noise, they had very good quantum efficiency, but they suffered from low speed. Um, you couldn't really um, image uh, at, at video frame rates or beyond. You were limited to maybe a few frames per second. And um, if the sensor was larger, for example, if you wanted to image um, you know, two megapixel or four megapixel field of view um, with a CCD, that may have meant one frame or uh, less than one frame per second. And that wasn't just fast enough for um, many live cell applications. So upon their arrival, EMC CDs have um, been really uh, the cameras of choice, or they have become cameras of choice because of their single photon sensitivity. Because of the EM gain, which I'll talk a little bit about in the next couple of slides, they have eliminated uh, the read noise detection limit. So you know you could really disregard uh, the noise figure that a, a CCD would have um, if that was, for example, two electrons noise. Um, of a CCD, EM cameras have uh, rendered this um, sub-electron and virtually zero uh, read noise. Um, high quantum efficiency, like I said, and then you could achieve fast frame rates, achieving sometimes thousands of frames with uh, so-called image cropping if you didn't need the full field of view. With a full field of view, you could probably achieve anywhere between 30 and 60 frames per second you know, for, for one megapixel sensor. And they, like I said, remain high in choice for light starved um, experiments where you are dealing with sometimes single photons or a few photons, like we have seen previously for um, single molecule uh, FRET and TERF combinations. Okay, so we have now talked about EMC CDs that they uh, reduce the readout dose and they can be great tools for low light imaging, but how do they achieve this? And in this slide, I have a couple of figures that illustrate the process behind this uh, electromultiplication. So they are not animations, they are stills, but I hope that you will get the idea really, really quickly. On the left-hand side, we can see a typical uh, frame transfer design of these sensors that you capture your image, in this case, this chili pepper in the image area. Then this image is shifted directly under the mask. This storage area is masked with an with a opaque uh, metal mask on top of it. And then image gets uh, slowly uh, read out in this readout register. So you basically shift this pixel row by pixel row and then digitize pixel or shift pixels um, individually along these registers. And you can see that there is a gain register in addition to the readout register, and that's where the multiplication happens. So that's where the, where the electrons are multiplied um, before our, before they are digitized in this uh, analog to digital converter. And because the, the digitization step is where the noise is added, uh, so to speak, um, if you can multiply your signal before it is converted, then you are reducing the, the noise contribution proportionally. So it's not that the noise becomes zero, it's just that the signal becomes so much larger in relation to that noise. And this uh, multiplication is achieved um, in a way that you can see here on the right hand side that uh, there are a few pixels uh, illustrated here of the EM gain register and these electrons that were created as a result of photon impinging on the sensor they are passing through these pixels of EM gain register and they are multiplied. It's basically like what I would like to call a snowball effect that you create more and more, uh, more electrons with every uh, step and because there are um, hundreds of these uh, EM gain pixels, you end up with very high uh, gain levels. So in this still, we can see there are some of these electrons passing through that uh, register. And then in the next stage, they are accelerated with a high voltage step to create more secondary electrons. And this is repeated over and over again um, to create a large number of electrons corresponding to the initial input um, uh, value that was created by single or maybe a few photons arriving at the sensor.
and that's how it looks like um, in context of a real sample so you know that's how emccd gain works and what it produces you have some single molecules uh, here shown here on the left um, at different uh, EM gain levels and then you can clearly see that with the increasing gain you basically increase signal to noise ratio and uh, then your signal becomes visible and can be acquired at that level and then analyzed further uh, for um, in your data analysis suite. So probably most of you have um, heard and uh, maybe used um, scientific CMOS cameras or S CMOS cameras. So how do these compare to EMCCDs? And uh, so this is a very basic comparison of single molecule type uh, setup where we are um, acquiring uh, images uh, across number of exposures. And you can probably notice that with EM camera, you start to see something in the range of tens of milliseconds. You know, you start to get enough signal to noise uh, separation that you know you probably could do something with this at 50 milliseconds and uh, with the CMOS cameras you probably will need you know 10 times longer exposure uh, in such conditions um, of course that differs and that depends on a on, on a CMOS camera whether it's a front or back illuminated camera um, but by and large EMCCDs will outperform CMOS cameras for this extremely low light signal uh, levels And this is shown in this uh, um, signal to noise uh, ratio plot, uh, where you can see that, for example, when we look at our uh, two cameras, Exxon is an EMCCD, Sona is, uh, is our scientific CMOS, you see that for um, low values of photons per pixel, um, extremely, well, essentially single photons, um, your EM camera will always outperform a CMOS camera. Uh, once you get to, you know, to the regime of tens of photons per pixel per exposure and above, then situation changes somewhat and then uh, your uh, CMOS camera will, de will deliver a better looking image. So what is the future of CC uh, EMCCDs in light of these uh, CMOS cameras? Uh, well, I think it's, it's fair to say that for single molecule fluorescence and low light imaging, uh, EMCCDs will remain cameras of choice. And this is just, just because the, the sheer sensitivity combined with EM gain application um, that, you know, if you are imaging single molecules like what we have seen earlier today, um, if you are combining these single molecule imaging uh, studies with rapid and sometimes real time imaging, um, you really need to have best signal to noise ratio uh, delivery tool and you know such tool is an EMCCD camera. I think this also becomes valid when you try to uh, do some uh, multiplexed imaging, you know, looking at different wavelengths coverages. Uh, EM cameras will deliver um, sensitivity across the entire quantum uh, efficiency curve. Of course, there will be some drop off towards extreme blue or extreme far red, but if these if these molecules these um, specimens that you're trying to image are broadly in the in the visible then these cameras will be always um, delivering sensitivity or quantum efficiency in the range of 95 90 90 95 percent um, i think interestingly um, in um, in cases of multimodal imaging combining for example afm and, and turf or maybe time resolved so doing more unusual um, combinations that um, that may have been the case you know, in the past you know 10 years um, these cameras offer that flexibility that you know you you can um, combine um, AFM and turf and look at these single molecules and you, you will still get a very nice very good signal to noise ratio and for example you can maybe reduce the vibration that the camera produces um, that may be um, maybe a, an important factor for AFM setup. You can switch off the fan for some time and then you will have some time, maybe um, a few minutes, depending on how fast and how deeply cooled the camera is to acquire images at, at complete standstill with, with no vibration coming from the camera. So there is still uh, lots of life in EMC technologies, I believe, um, but it is also fair to say that CMOS cameras are making inroads uh, into this field thanks to increases in speed and sensitivity. However, EM is still the, the, the main differentiating factor between CMOS and EM CCDs, and I think that will remain the case for, for the foreseeable future.
So thank you very much for, for your attention. I hope you found this informative. And if you have any questions about any of these camera technologies or, cam or cameras that you would like to find out more, uh, please drop me an email um, on the email address I, I have added here. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Storman and Dr. Barsuski for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Now, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Now, we have some great questions coming in. Dr. Storman, let's start with you. What settings did you use for image acquisition, exposure, camera settings, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's um, uh, especially in light of Marston's presentation, I think that, that is a fun question. Um, so Stefan put a lot of work in figuring out um, what, his, what the best uh, settings were. And remarkably, even though we have EMCCD cameras, which in part is because we built this microscope already in 2011 before CMOS cameras became popular, um, he found that it was better for him to not use the electron multiplication registry, but rather use the classical readout mode of the camera. And in part, that is because we could go to long exposure times. These single molecules were not moving. So he used a slow uh, readout mode of the camera. He read it out at 3 megahertz, which reduces the uh, readout noise and that also limited his exposure time to something on the order of 300 milliseconds, if I uh, remember correctly. So um, uh, it, it is kind of of interest to me whether we would be able to get better localization precision with the CMOS camera versus this classical CCD readout mode. But in this mode, we were able to get these uh, very high precision distance measurements. Thank you, Dr. Storman. Now, Dr. Barsuski, let's come over to you. Do you think that the EMCCDs will ever be superseded by CMOS cameras? And if yes, when? Well, thank you very much for this question. I think it's a really interesting one. And I, I keep hearing it um, more and more frequently. I think the CMOS, uh, scientific CMOS cameras have become so widely used these days that I think it's only natural that people keep asking questions when, if ever, they will become as good as the old uh, EMCCDs. And I think, well, there, it's not easy really to answer this question because um, I think, you know, fundamentally, um, CMOS will never be as, uh, as sensitive as EMCCDs when it comes to the fact that uh, read noise in EM cameras can be essentially suppressed, you know, to sub-electron levels thanks to the EM gain. CMOS cameras will not have it for the foreseeable future. Uh, simply because you would need to apply or build in uh, EM gain on a single pixel level. And then, of course, these gains would differ across the entire matrix of a, of a chip. So you end up with 4.2 or 5.5 million EM registers with their own variants. So um, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that I think EM cameras will remain um, dominant, especially for these extremely light starved conditions, uh, when you really need to apply high EM gain settings to suppress the uh, readout noise. So um, there may be time uh, where CMOS cameras reduce their readout noise so much that they start to approach these really low um, light regimes capable of um, being addressed by EM cameras, but I would say that's still a number of years away. Thank you, Dr. Prasuski. Now, this next question um, I'll throw out to both of you. Now, your SCMOS camera is not as good as EMCCD below 500, but why do some labs use CMOS cameras for single molecule FRET experiments? Nico, do you want to answer yeah, this? Um, or, uh... um, well, maybe I can start. I, I think that um, maybe the uh, uh, the parameter below 500 milliseconds is, is a little too simplistic. I think what it really comes down to is the photon flux. So how many photons do you get per exposure? And so um, if uh, 
your photon flux is in the couple of electrons per uh, 500 milliseconds, sorry, couple of photons per 500 milliseconds level, then um, the EM CCD will be definitely perform better, whereas when that photon flux is higher, you will have, uh, you possibly could have an uh, advantage using a CMOS. In our single molecule experiments, we find a few thousand photons per uh, exposure. So that would actually be based on that already in the regimen where uh, the CMOS could have a higher signal noise ratio. But maybe you want to expand on that, Marcia? Yes, I think that's a really, really valid point, Nico, that um, it, it, it really boils down to the photon flux. Um, and um, what I didn't really discuss in detail in my presentation is that um, whenever we look at these um, sensitivity curves, um, they are really done on a per pixel, uh, number of photons per pixel per exposure basis. So you're right, you know, if you are looking at really a low flux um, you know, per unit time, you will need an EMCCD camera, but uh, if the flux is, is, is higher, then CMOS may well be um, as good as an EMCCD. So it really depends on the application a lot. And I think that's why we always, well, I would always recommend comparing the two cameras if that's possible, because you, know, you may realize that you don't need EM um, and, and the CMOS may be perfectly viable solution for that um, experiment. Thank you, gentlemen. Dr. Sturman, let's come back over to you. Did you acquire the two channel images simultaneously or sequentially and why? Yes, yeah, so um, in principle, we would love to acquire them simultaneously, and that's also how we built the microscope. So there's an image splitting dichroic mirror within the microscope so that we can expose the two cameras at the same time. However, we found that when we excite the dye at the lower wavelength, in our case, it's a, a dye like size three, we get um, a significant amount of background in the higher wavelength channel, in the Psi 5 channel. And that uh, background is caused by things like the oil, the oil immersion, and even the glass of the objectives as well as the sample holders. So this background is very detrimental to localization precision. And because of that reason, we had to take these images sequentially. And we put a lot of effort into uh, setting up the system so that we can get the, the two images very rapidly, one after another. So ideally, simultaneously, because of practical reasons, sequentially. Thanks, Dr. Storman. Now let's have you answer this next slide. Can this technique be extended to more colors? Absolutely. Um, and again, we can do that with two cameras because we uh, acquire the images sequentially. And Stefan right now is um, is doing experiments in which he uses uh, three uh, labels on one and the same uh, protein and um, uh, localize those three with respect to each other. Thank you, Dr. Storman. Now we're almost out of time. Um, Dr. Bartuski, let's have you answer this last question. Can AMCCDs be used to detect single photons with the same precision as single point detectors? Um, the short answer is no. Um, just because of the properties of noise that these sensors have. Um, um, single point detectors are um, designed precisely for detecting um, single photons, um, but they are limited you know, by the fact that they are a point detector, so they cannot take an image. Uh, a camera, an EMCCD camera, will take an image. It can be an extremely low light image, but because of the noise distribution and uncertainty on top of the multiplication process, you may remember the one I talked about, the EM gain register cascading electrons through the register, there is certain distribution of, of, uh, of electrons that are being created. And because of these different uh, uh, distributions of um, you know, likelihoods and probabilities occurring in, in the camera, you will never be able to say that that was exactly one photon or two photons hitting that pixel. So um, you know, these cameras will, will not deliver the same um, 
detection uh, capability a single point. However, they, take, they can take an image, which sometimes is uh, what you exactly need. If you have a larger 2D area, uh, scanning that area with a single point detectors would just take too much time in case there's a very rapid process occurring and you want to capture the process in its entirety without risking losing some details of this by, by line by line scanning. Thank you, Dr. Barsuski. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Those questions we did not have time to answer today and those that will be submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. I would like to once again thank Dr. Nico Sturman and Dr. Marcin Barsuski for their time today and for their important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor Andor for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now this webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.